I did say to James that my talk on paper is about 45 to 50 minutes, which in my experience means I'll probably talk for an hour. Um, so just um, try and bear with me if you can. I also do, I did prepare a handout with um, some of the, the literature that I'm drawing on tonight and some suggestions for further reading, which I, however, then forgot about, so we don't have that printed out. Um, but I'm sure if you're interested in, in exploring some of these themes uh, further, then th th there will be a way that we can distribute that some, in some electronic form. Um, when I was talking to James and Joel um, about this lecture tonight and how it was going to fit into this project as a whole, uh, they stressed that they were really keen for me to talk about some of the activist components of my research. Um, human rights activism specifically is something that plays a really big uh, role in the work that I'm currently doing. Uh, the initial impetus that I had for starting to explore the connections between music and violence, for example, um, came in part because um, of my, or, or came in part through my human rights activism. Um, I was for many years, um, while I was living in Germany, a very committed uh, local member of Amnesty International, um, and that very much informed uh, also the approaches that I took towards uh, this, this topic um, through the training that I received, their training in things to do with international human rights law, all of these kind of things, which has been invaluable um, in the work that I've done recently and has, has really had an impact upon it. Um, I try to give that back a little bit in, in the sense that when I'm working on music and torture, um, also in my research and, training, and teaching training on other issues relevant to the topic of human rights, such as when I, I teach about uh, music and racism, I always try and take the opportunity to engage in some human rights education um, so that I can kind of feedback some of that, what I've benefited um, from, um, from what I've learned through the years of human rights activism. Um, on a related but quite different note, I've also uh, been in discussion with one of the legal defence teams who are currently working with uh, one of the men still detained in Guantanamo Bay um, who was tortured using music um, and so they're interested in um, finding out the ways to be able to demonstrate um, at his um, trial or his, his military tribunal um, that basically the evidence that's been gathered from him can't actually be admitted because it was um, it was gained under torture. Um, I, I'm not actually going to talk about any of those aspects um, tonight, despite this big long conversation that I had with um, James and Joel, but I can talk about any of the, those aspects um, in the discussion to follow. If there's anything else that you generally are interested in knowing about the subject of how music is used in torture, I'm, I'm very, very happy to go into that at the end. Um, one thing I would say, though, is that when we had these conversations, I had a little bit of a difficulty with the request to talk about the activist dimensions of my work as an academic, because there seemed to be an implication in there that intellectual work itself isn't activist, um, which obviously depends on how we define activism, where we draw the line between um, politics and activism. Um, but I think that in this the present climate that we're in, the present cultural and political climate, where we're seeing a resurgence of... Uh, fascism, I've got proto-fascism down here, but I think the proto is kind of, with every week that advances, kind of falling by the wayside. Uh, we're seeing a resurgence of fascist ideologies, um, fascist politics in many supposedly democratic countries. Um, and in that context, I think that intellectual work in the narrower sense um, is itself a very, very essential part of activism. And that's because fundamentally it is communication, it's rhetoric, it's discourse, it's how we think about things and express things. These are the very foundation of how societies are organised. Uh, none of these things, communication, rhetoric, discourse, none of these are the sole province of verbal language. Um, although when academics talk, you often get that impression. Um, as a musicologist, I do, of course, focus on musical communication in the very widest sense of that term. Um, and I said, I'm consciously saying musical communication rather than just music because the latter sounds very much like a thing. Um, it's a product, it's a commodity rather than an activity, a mode of interaction. Um, and also because when I'm talking about musical communication or I sometimes refer to musical practices, musical activities, um, I'm, related, I'm, I'm referring not necessarily just to music as we might most commonly think of it, but also to uh, closely related forms of communication and expression such as dance, for example. Um, and also something that's going to play a really big role in this talk tonight, uh, the symbolic content of musical communication and how this finds expression in other forms of communication, for example, in material culture um, and also in the visual arts. So I have a really broad uh, way of looking um, at or thinking about music and musical communication 
um, as I think will become um, very obvious um, very early on. Um, so like I say, the, the very idea of society implies communication and how we think about and portray and represent different members of society is directly related um, to how we treat them. So the first thing I want to talk about in this lecture um, is uh, an ideology. Um, now this word ideology is, it has very negative connotations and you know I'm not going to lie to you, it's going to have some negative connotations in what I say tonight as well. Uh, but it is one of those kind of words like propaganda, you know, I have a belief system, you have an ideology. It's always something that's kind of like pushed onto the, the other person, the other person's ideas. The reason I'm using this word ideology, um, I kind of want to use it in its uh, one of its uses, um, which is um, simply to talk to as um, a way to capture this idea of there being a system of ideas. So it's not necessarily problematizing the use of this ideology. It's just saying that there are interconnected ideas um, that are functioning in a particular um, fashion, as it says here in this OED definition, a systematic scheme of ideas, usually relating to politics, economics, or society and forming the basis of action or policy, a set of beliefs that are governing conduct. And this is what I'm kind of talking about here. Um, also, ideology can be used in the sense of the study of these systems of thought. So that's kind of what I'm talking about. I'm not necessarily talking about political ideology, um, although the ideology I'm going to talk about is politically very important as well. And I'm going to be um, talking specifically about one of the most important ideologies in this sense um, of Western civilization. Um, I'd go so far as to call it a foundational ideology of Western civilization for reasons um, that will become apparent, I hope, in a minute. And I'll be focusing particularly on some subsets of this ideology that revolve around the idea of sound, and then using these um, to explore the wider implications of the relationship between music and punishment, including music and torture in the past, um, but also in the present, and hopefully as a way to, to begin to explain um, some of the, the, the reasons why music has become implicated in punishment and torture, and also some of the, the attitudes um, that, that arise today when people try to talk about uh, music and torture, um, or explore it or understand um, the idea of music and torture. So what ideology am I talking about? Well, I call it by the shorthand Greeks and Barbarians because this is the context in which it first seems to have appeared, at least in terms of the official intellectual history of Western civilization. Um, I first started thinking along these lines um, after a talk uh, that I was fortunate enough to hear um, given by Christian Moser, um, who's a professor of comparative literature at the University of Bonn. Um, he, at that point, was involved in um, an inter international graduate uh, research programme on foundational myths of Europe. Um, and you can see this, this book here, um, in German, um, is one of the publications that came out of that. Um, what was interesting about his talk was that he was basically exploring how the idea of the barbarian is used nowadays in the 21st century in almost exactly the same way that it was used um, in Athens in 5th century BC. That's obviously quite unusual. Normally when we talk about um, different terms that might be very important today in, in our discursive way of thinking, um, historically they tend to have very different meanings and very different connotations. But as he explored using a number of examples, actually we can see more or less it means the same thing now as it did in the 5th century. It's used with the same um, implications and it's used for the same purposes. Um, and he explored this referring to various examples. These included um, George W. Bush's speeches after 9-11 um, and comparing us also to the um, English classicist Edith Hall's book, um, Inventing the Barbarian. Um, what she does in this book is look at um, Athenian drama of the period in, um, following the Persian War um, a time at which um, the, the idea of the, the or the, even the terminology of the barbarian was invented um, and in particular what she's interested in is not so much the idea of inventing the barbarian but as you might be able to make out the, the, the subtitle here, Greek self-definition through tragedy. It was actually all about how early Athenian democracy, early Athenian civilization, specifically defined itself in opposition to this other that was formed by the barbarian. Um, so that's why I use the term Greeks and Barbarians, just as a really um, effective shorthand for this. So what is this ideology? Well, it's effectively, it's an ideology made up of um, oppositions. It's very, very important. All of these terms individually 
um, you'll see kind of the Greeks and then the barbarians on the other side. Um, it's not so much about the individual terms, it's always about what they mean in connection with the, the opposed term. Um, I've already mentioned some of the central um, features of this ideology, the contrast between obviously Greeks and barbarians, um, between the civilised and the uncivilised, between um, the, the with the wilds and savage in two points here, sorry that was a mistake, I thought I'd taken that out there. Uh, the civilised people on the one hand, the uncivilised or the wilds and the savage on the other. Um, I probably don't really need to point out that this is an ideology that's played um, a fundamental role in the history of colonialism, which we've already discussed briefly tonight. Uh, it's also something that you find again and again in propaganda for war. Um, as well, this is a brilliant poster. This is a, a recruitment poster um, from the time of the USA's entry into World War I. Um, classic tropes of, of musical out of um, war propaganda there. Um, I should also point out this is 1917. This is about 16, 17 years before um, the film of King Kong appeared. So it's already kind of got all of those um, tropes in there that then um, carry on throughout history. But there are other forms that this opposition can take as well, um, if we think this further. So for example, it's the contrast between culture and nature. Um, another important aspect that comes through sometimes is the contrast between settled societies and, on the one hand and nomads on the other. Now this could be the approaching Mongolian hordes, which I think is possibly one of the reasons why this has been so important um, also in Western culture. Um, but it continues to resonate in present day society um, if you think of the continued discrimination that's faced uh, by many communities who are seen as being by nature nomadic even though they, they effectively aren't in the present day. Um, in Europe, for example, this is primarily directed at Roma and traveller communities, um, but it also does play um, a role in the, the history of anti-Semitism up to the present day. Then we have forms that play um, specifically on the contrast of political and normative frameworks. So we have democracy versus despotism, for example, rule of law versus lawlessness, um, parliamentary or civic debate versus direct action or protest. Um, in more general terms, the contrast between discipline and order and chaos and disorder, um, between those who exercise self-control and those who have no self-control. Um, and then if you move back onto kind of slightly higher level categories, generalised categories, of course, it's the contrast between West and East, between masculine and feminine. And this brings us to the, what I would regard as being the, the absolutely foundational elements or oppositions of this foundational ideology, the ones to which really all of these others can be reduced, which is the contrast between the rational and the ir irrational, or reason and emotion. This is something that is, becomes very, very important. Take five minutes to go on to social media, um, two minutes even, uh, and you'll immediately come across examples of this in, in action with any kind of political debate that you encounter on social media. The minute that somebody says someone's argument is stupid um, or that they're talking nonsense, for example, you're effectively using this ideology. You're effectively putting down the other person's argument by placing them on the barbarian side um, of this divide. Um, women experience this all the time with the phenomenon known as mansplaining, you know, where uh, repeatedly some men seem to think that they are less capable of you know, intellectual thought. I can see a lot of women growing in the audience. Um, and that's another way in which this actually carries on into the present day. Um, so this ideology has been used to justify colonialism, racism, misogyny, um, discrimination against disabled people. It's been used to keep people of colour, women, lower class people and children in their places. Um, children, for example, violence against children in the form of corporal punishment is very often justified by um, saying that you can't reason with children, so you have to use another method um, of discipline against them. Um, now, certainly it is possible to be racist and sexist and ageist and ableist without this ideology. Other ideologies are available. Um, but in Western civilization, quote unquote civilization, I should say, um, this is basically your starter kit. You know, you can kind of go quite a long way just with this one. <laughs> so why is this relevant to music? Well, there are a whole number of reasons, one of which is that, you know, music takes place in this same society, um, music in the context of Western civilization, um, also reflects aspects of this thinking, how we think about music, how we talk about music, how we make music, how we evaluate music specifically, um, is also impacted on um, by, by this um, type of thinking. A um, classic example is how 
Western art music is portrayed as being superior to absolutely everything else. Um, but there is a deeper connection to this as well, and it has to do with some of the, the very original um, oppositions of this ideology, um, starting with the term um, barbarian itself. Um, now, some of you might know the word barbarian basically originally means somebody that can't speak. Now, what it actually means is somebody that can't speak Greek in this context, um, but it's this idea of somebody who is not able to take part in civilised debate through language because they don't speak language. They, 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 they do something else with their mouth, but it's not something that we could call language. Um, it's a, a sonic play as well on the term babbling, um, which refers to the vocalisations that are made by babies when they're learning their own language, but they can't actually speak their own language. Um, and it was, it's not just the Greeks that have done this. Um, if you look at um, Poland um, and a lot of other Slavic countries, the Polish word for Germany, for example, is Niemczy, which means, literally means they can't speak. Um, so it's, it, this demonstrates how this, this idea of the other who's not able to, to engage um, in speech um, is, is, is quite fundamental. So this is where we are already start. We talked a lot, a lot about this today um, in the workshop. Um, about the problems associated with um, witnesses or also defendants in criminal trials, if they speak in a vernacular, if they speak in a language that's not deemed to be the proper high language um, of that society, um, then that almost invariably works against them. Now, this, so this distinction between the Greeks that have language, the barbarians who have no language, um, is linked then to some other central... Um, oppositions in this ideology that you will find time and again in different contexts. It's basically the difference between sound that makes sense and sound that doesn't make sense, so sense and nonsense, if you think about it like that. Um, but there's a, a lot of other levels of sonic oppositions that you can then derive from this. Um, one of them, for example, is the contrast between speech or verbal language and music. Um, music as being emotional rather than rational um, in this regard is then sometimes used um, to signify uh, the other. Um, Edith Hall, for example, talks about this in her discussion um, of the Athenian tragedy. She talks about how the figure of the foreigner is actually portrayed through the language. Um, and in some cases, she notes that the distinction between Greeks and barbarians is indicated by opposing spoken language and music. So you'll actually have dramas uh, where the barbarians and only the barbarians communicate through song, for example. But opposing speech and music in this way is only one of the possibilities. Um, you can also go deeper into the musical dimension itself um, and draw out different levels here between music that makes sense to some people and music that does not make sense. Uh, music that is merely sound, for example, this is where you come very close, uh, closely back again to traditional musicology. Um, a few other examples, the, the distinction between harmony and dissonance, for example, um, is a really, really central one here. Um, but harmony, um, the title of my talk tonight is Harm and Harmony, and so obviously this is something I'm going to be focusing on. Um, harmony can be contrasted with other things as well. Um, in modern Western discourse on music, we often see harmony being represented as something which really only the progressive you know, white Europeans could actually develop. Um, so it's seen as a marker of an apparently more sophisticated musical language. And as such, it's often contrasted with other things um, such as rhythm. So this is, for example, how you then end up with all these tropes about how Africans have this nat natural rhythm. Um, and that's a classic example of something that sounds as if it's a positive thing that you're saying about somebody, but in actual fact, it's deeply prejudicial and deeply discriminatory because in terms of the, o the overriding ideology, you're actually saying they're good at something which isn't actually as good as the things that we can do. More generally and fundamentally, um, the other is associated with noise, with quite literally creating a disturbance, disturbing the harmony um, of civilised society. And it's this point in particular um, that comes to the fore in the examples I'm going to talk about now. So I'm going to return to music specifically in a moment, but... I wanted to show this first. I just found this um, quite recently um, when I was in Constance in southern Germany. Um, these are leaflets and posters from a campaign run by the local government, supposedly to crack down on organised um, begging gangs. Um, now, I have given you the 
English translation on the right hand side here. I should say, however, it's not the best of translations. I'm not entirely sure how they come up with panhandling as a translation for begging. I don't know what, what kind of century English dictionary they were using there. Um, and also the way that um, the German has been translated into English, but it talks about not just panhandling, but aggressive panhandling. <laughs> Um, that's a lot stronger than what's in the um, the German original. The German original phrase "aufdringlich" is more a, a bit like obtrusive, so it's not actually aggressive um, to that extent. But there are also some things in the the German leaflet specifically that don't make it into the English, and which are very important, because the German leaflet specifically compares this obtrusive begging, so this begging that's problematic. Um, with what it calls begging in silence and qu or quiet begging. And this is important because you're allowed to beg in silence, you're just not allowed to be obtrusive. And even the pictures that you see um, at the top here indicate that this obtrusive or aggressive begging, um, it doesn't actually always necessitate any kind of use of language. And um, for example, it's also used to cover um, when um, people take their children with them when they're begging, for example. Um, but it also kind of makes clear, simply asking somebody for money, that is seen as being something that's aggressive. That is already something that's seen as being over the limits. Um, so I find this example interesting on an awful lot of different levels. Um, what they've done in the local government, and I've, I've looked into this a bit further, and this seems to be a strategy that quite a lot of local governments in, um, in Germany and Austria are now taking. Um, they're not making begging illegal. You are allowed to beg um, as long as it's not obvious. So as long as people have a chance to ignore what's going on, um, that's fine. So it's illegal to disturb somebody with your poverty, but you can sit there and be poor as long as you don't draw attention to yourself. Um, the other thing is that this resonates with centuries of prohibitions that specifically link vagrancy and sound creation. Um, now, there are various different reasons why these prohibitions have arisen. Um, for example, in 17th century England, um, under Oliver Cromwell, um, the singing of broadside songs on the street was banned because it was recognised that this is one of the ways that um, oppositional political ideologies were getting spread around. So there's various different political rationales um, behind um, these links between vagrancy and sound creation as being something that's outside of the law. Um, but it is something that you will find time and time again um, if you look at legal history. And I think this is relevant here as well because, um, as I said, this campaign was a reaction to one particular type of begging, but what they call organised begging. Um, the authorities are very careful not to racialise this, um, but from my own experience um, in these countries, they are specifically directing it at a particular group, which are basically um, Roma migrants who've come from South um, southeastern Europe um, to live in the countries of Western Europe. So again, there you have this community who's classically presented as being nomadic, is kind of linked into this idea of them having to be quiet and not allowed to beg and we have to kind of somehow um, silence them because they're problematic. Um, and like I said, the terminology is interesting because it specifically links this aggression um, and this disturbance to sound, even though actively speaking is only one of the types of begging uh, behaviour which is um, covered by this term. Um, so it's quite interesting on many different levels. Um, we'll leave that and come back a little bit to music. Um, and an iconographic example from the early 16th century, one of um, quite a few that I'm going to compare and contrast um, tonight. Um, the general topic here is one that um, will be quite familiar to you. You possibly can't really see it um, the way it's been presented here, but this is a triptych um, portraying the last judgment from the biblical book of Revelations and Apocalypse. Um, now, representations of the Last Judgment very frequently includes musical symbolism, um, most ty typically trumpets played by angels, which you can see here just at the, the centre um, of this panel. Um, I could wax lyrical about the, the symbolism of trumpets and law and all of these things, um, but I won't do that because what actually interests me in this painting is something else entirely, um, which you'll only be able to see here when you really focus in. It's very small details, but very, very significant details. If you look here at the right hand side, um, so this is on the main panel up here, I've um, made it a little bit bigger here. Um, what you see are, well first of all, um, a German flute and a drum being played. 
um, to accompany this series of very weird creatures and devils um, that are carrying um, those who have been condemned off to hell. And this contrasts with a tiny little detail that you find, find in the left-hand panel, which is this one here, where you see you know, no devils, no weird creatures, but a nice little angel, complete with wings and nice white garment, um, who is playing music on a lute to the saved and the purified souls after they've been purified in this river that you can just about maybe make out here. Um, now, the lute was an instrument that was capable of creating an harmony, and thus also representing harmony, um, and it was very, very often used um, with this um, symbolic connotation in mind. Um, the lute was also an instrument which was deemed more refined, more civilised in this era, than the type of monodic and percussive music which were, um, or you know, peasant music, um, that were represented here by the, the flute and the drum. These were also instruments that at that point were linked with soldiering and specifically with the rank and file, so the lower kind of class element of soldiering and not the, the, the trumpets that you associate with the military, which were always associated with the monarchs and the nobility, which is why you know, they're playing in heaven um, while the, the flute and the drum play down here on the ground. Um, we will come back to this um, in a minute. Another example here um, from more or less the, the same era, and one that more specifically deals with uh, the topic of torture. Another biblical theme, um, this is Matthias Grunewald's painting of the flogging of Jesus of Nazareth. Um, now this biblical passage that he's referencing here um, is itself actually very, very interesting for historians of torture, which is why I've quoted it here. Um, from the King James translation, it says, And the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him, and when they had blindfolded him, they struck him in the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is it that smote thee? So according to this, the prisoner is being taunted um, through being hit by a blindfolded, and because he's blindfolded, he can't say um, from where the next strike is going to come, um, when it's going to come. That is not insignificant, um, if you know anything about the psychological elements of torture, um, because some recent studies have argued that the fear and the uncertainty that come in the context of torture are the really crucial elements when it comes to causing um, long-term traumatisation after the event. Um, we also see something in, in this description which is very typical of torture in other contexts as well, namely that the type of torture that's used is specific to the context. So because Jesus was portrayed as a prophet, um, they are trying to mock him on that basis by trying to get him to predict where the next strike is going to come from. Looking closely at how Grunewald decides to, um, to represent this, um, he goes a little bit further um, than the biblical descriptions in many respects. Um, and here as well, I think it's really interesting to think a little bit about what's portrayed here and compare it to much more modern methods of torture. You'll notice, for example, that the arms of Jesus are very, very tightly bound here, and also that he's been more or less held on a leash. Um, this might bring to mind some of the more recent, very, very famous pictures of torture um, that came out of Abu Ghraib, for example, um, about 15 years ago. Um, and the other thing to notice is that in this particular picture, the blindfold is being shown as covering the ears and not just the eyes. Um, and that, again, is, is pretty striking when we compare it to, um, again, some much more recent and very famous um, um, well, portrayals or, or direct representations in this case, um, photographic testimony of um, torture specifically um, in the context of the US war on terror. Um, now, I don't want to overemphasize the commonalities here because what we're seeing is a, a visual comparison what torture looks like and what it actually feels like are not the same. Um, and what we're actually seeing portrayed um, in these pictures where you'll see, whoops, it was the wrong one, um, where you'll see um, each of the prisoners here, they have earphones on, they are blindfolded, their mouths are covered, they're also wearing, uh, their arms are tied together, they're also wearing big thick gloves so that they can't feel anything. Um, what we're actually seeing here is a quite specific technique of torture that was developed and honed in the mid 20th century and this technique works by completely isolating the victim from any kind of sensory interaction with their environment. Um, so hence the dark glasses, the earmuffs, the stress position of the body, um, the, the fact that they, they can't touch anything with their hands. All of these elements are designed to make sure that the basic 
human sensory system can't do its job. And because it can't do its job, these kind of techniques can lead to um, really basic physiological and psychological trauma within a very short space of time. And this is why, although this is often classed as being a form of psychological torture, these sensory deprivation techniques, as they're known, have a direct physiological impact um, by preventing the, the human senses from doing their normal job. Human bodies aren't designed for that. We're designed to be constantly um, picking up ideas from our environment. And the minute that you stop a human body from doing that, the effects can really be quite devastating within a really, really short space of time. Now, there's very many different ways that torturers can attack human physiology um, in ways that, to some extent, are related to this, um, in ways that are psychologically devastating, but which, quite importantly, don't require any physical contact, um, don't require necessarily that the person who's doing the torturing is even aware of the harm that they're causing. Um, sleep deprivation is one example that's been used for decades, probably centuries, um, especially where the victim is um, also made to lose any sense of time. So, for example, if somebody is not only deprived of sleep, always constantly, you know, woken when they try to get to sleep, combine that with being kept in a room which is permanently dark or permanently light, again, very quickly they will lose all kind of sense of orientation to time, which is something that can be added onto the sleep deprivation very, very harmful. Um, as we know from investigations into these recent US practices, um, in many, many cases, it's not the impos imposition of silence, for example, through these headphones, um, but the imposition of sound that's used in sensory deprivation um, techniques or, or techniques that are derived from this. Um, sometimes you, the phrase sensory overload is used to get this idea across about the fact that you're not taking away somebody's sense, you're actually overpowering it um, with a constant sound um, or, in many cases, also constant music. Um, now, this technique is well known from um, what has happened, um, as I say, in the recent uh, US examples, but it does have a longer history. There's a very uh, famous European case that predates this by se several decades um, regarding what was, um, in that case, called the, the five techniques. These were techniques that were used against prisoners in Northern Ireland uh, during the Troubles there in the early 1970s. Um, and in that case, too, the, the prisoners were, um, amongst other things, exposed to a constant sound, which they described as being like that of a heating or an air conditioning unit. Um, now, this particular example of the five techniques in Northern Ireland um, has become quite famous because it was the subject both of an official inquiry in the UK, um, but also after the official inquiry decided that this, um, this wasn't torture. One of the reasons why they said it wasn't torture is that they said, well, these techniques have been used in the colonies for decades and nobody's complained about them before. Go figure. Um, um, but when that investigation came back as being this is actually all fine and maybe we should just make sure that we're not excessively using this technique but it's basically fine, at that point the Republic of Ireland took the UK to um, the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, the European Court of Human Rights, in their original judgement, decided that this wasn't serious enough to be regarded as torture but that it was serious enough to present in human and degrading punishment. Um, which is just as much banned as is torture um, under um, human rights legislation. Now that was in the 1970s and the assessment regarding these techniques has been revised quite a lot in the intervening period. Um, and I'll come back to that a little bit um, later as well. Um, so now that we're into the history of torture though, I want to pan back um, a few centuries. Again, you might not be able to make out um, what I'm showing here, um, you possibly can just make out this kind of bell shape thing here. Um, this is one of many um, torture instruments from the Middle Ages that was made in the shape of a musical instrument. Um, there are various theories surrounding these devices. Um, you have ones that look um, slightly like a violin. Um, this one here is often called the flute of shame, although it might be, I'm slightly sceptical if it's actually supposed to represent a flute, it might be some other kind of instrument such as a shawm. Um, there are here, there are kind of little finger clamps so that when you hold the instrument in the, the style that you would have been playing, um, these can obviously then be screwed down and screwed down and screwed down and you can imagine the rest of it. Um, there's various different theories surrounding these devices. Um, it has been said, for example, that it was a form of punishment that was specifically developed for bad musicians. Um, I'm not 
entirely convinced by that, but I, I haven't done enough of the enough archival research to be able to see one thing um, or another. Um, what is clear is that they were obviously linked to what were at that point very demonstrative and very public practices of public uh, punishment and torture. Um, it has been suggested that the underlying meaning um, has to do with this again this idea of there being a break in the harmony of the community um, and that this by playing this um, this wrong type of music somehow this is actually going to reset the balance and bring back the harmony into the community um, but obviously as well the, the element of mockery is very important here as well um, by using something which is supposed to be a source of you know great joy and pleasure um, in the context of um, torture and punishment and humiliation and that again is something that recurs again and again um, over the ages. Now these instruments of torture um, might look like musical instruments um, but the, you can't actually produce any sound on them. Um, we would have to have a whole bore here if this, this instrument is going to be played but it's just a solid piece of metal. Um, some people have suggested that there might have been earlier um, punishment rituals um, from which these derive, which did use um, actual musical instruments or, or instruments that could at least produce some noise. Um, but as I say, the, the, the jury is kind of a little bit still out in that. Um, what we do know, however, is that actual sounding music, not just the representation of musical instruments, but actual sounding music, has been a central component of practices of torture and punishment for many centuries. Um, and at this point I want to go back to our um, painting by Grunewald and also to compare this again to what's happening in um, this little detail from the triptych. Um, what I hadn't talked about earlier, and it might have been the first thing some of you noticed, is that in this corner there is a man playing um, an instrument, which is actually two instruments, but it's one instrument because it's played by one person. This is the pipe and tabor. Um, which is basically obviously very closely related to what we see here uh, as well. So you have a, a flute-like instrument or the pipe um, then accompanied by a drum here. Now this goes way beyond what the biblical sources detail that Grunewald is drawing on. Um, it might suggest the fact that he puts this musician in here. Um, it might be that this is indicating some kind of influence from um, existing practices which you knew of punishment or torture. Um, so it might be that the man is playing the pipe and tabor in the background um, because this was something that happened in contemporary punishment practices that he was drawing on. Um, we do know from other types of historical evidence that music uh, was played um, pretty much a standard at some public forms of punishment um, in the medieval and early modern periods, um, particularly, particularly at executions. Um, but the other thing as well, we, we, we shouldn't jump too quickly to the conclusion that this is actually supposed to be portraying something that actually happens because the, the iconographic significance of what we see here, similar to what we see in, in this picture, it might be to some extent it's reflecting an existing practice, but those practices themselves have a very, very strong symbolic element. Um, and here it's very important to note that it's again the same instrument played here effectively as is played here with all of the different connotations that those instruments have as being kind of associated with the lower classes, possibly also with the vagrant classes such as foot soldiers would have been at this time. Um, interestingly, there's an article by um, John Planer on musical iconography in the art of Hieronymus Bosch um, where he points out amongst other things that in paintings of this period, itinerant musicians are very often marked out in paintings as being Jewish. Um, now, as I've already mentioned, there's a very long history linking vagrancy and sound um, production and prohibitions on those acts. Um, and I think it's very interesting to consider that this is often portrayed specifically through marking somebody off as being Jewish. It doesn't necessarily mean that the itinerant musicians were Jewish. That's not something that I'm, I'm particularly familiar with, um, of there being you know, a, a large subsection of the mu musical community that were Jewish. Um, but presenting these musicians as such very, very obviously communicates something um, quite important in what was at that point a thoroughly anti-Semitic climate. Um, and interesting if you come to a couple of other, well, contemporary, in one case, an earlier representation of this um, same passage from the Bible, um, one by Dürer, which I have used before, and I was delighted to um, realise that the image I used is actually from the National Gallery of Victoria in Melbourne. Um, both of these also show a musical instrument, but it's a little bit different um, to what Grunewald shows. You'll see this, whoops, keep doing that, um, up here and also here on, on this representation. 
um, you'll see a very large and what looks like a quite a natural horn, so not a, not a trumpet made out of metal, but a, a natural horn such as you would get um, from a ram's horn or something. And, and also be directed right at the head of Jesus, I mean, right up into his ears. Now, you can imagine this as being, even looking at this, you can imagine what that does to somebody. It's very, very easy, I think, to, to think of that as representing some form of punishment um, or torture. But again, I'm not entirely sure that that is the, the, the particular um, thing that's being communicated here, because I think that this instrument almost certainly is supposed to be a shofar. The shofar is the, the Jewish ritual trumpet. Um, and the, the sound of the shofar and the sound of Jewish worship generally um, was typically represented um, right up until at least the 19th century as being very, very unpleasant, as, as presenting a kind of cacophony. Again, a sound that made no sense, a music that made no sense, it was only nonsense. Um, if you're interested in this topic, there's a fabulous book by Ruth Hakon um, called The Music Libel Against the Jews, and she goes into an awful lot of different examples of this um, right through from the medieval uh, period up into the 20th century. So it's possible that this is what's been represented here, that these are the, you know, the Jews that are torturing Jesus, it feeds into that whole um, anti-Semitism, um, and particularly the, ways, the anti-Semitic ways in which the passion um, of Jesus was very often represented in Christian art um, of the early modern period, um, including, for example, in Bach's St. John Passion, which is a very um, well-known and very controversial, um, yeah, very controversial topic. Um, so what we're seeing here is again this coming together of some of the central oppositions that we had in our original Greeks and Barbarians ideology um, in the service of punishment, representations of punishments, but in some cases actually representations of punishment that actually are founded on actual practices of punishment. Um, so we have the opposition of ideas of the self and the other, harmony and harm, um, and also the disturbance caused by the other and somehow trying to recreate this harmony in the community. And this is also the case with the so-called uh, Charivari traditions. Now, Charivari is actually um, originally the French term um, for one of these traditions. These are traditions that you find um, or fa would have found all over Europe from the Middle Ages up until, uh, in some cases, well into the 20th century. Charivari traditions are traditions of folk justice, so they're outside of the boundaries of um, the, the, the normal justice system. Uh, they were very often prohibited uh, by the church, so they were very much themselves, as it were, illegal justice systems. Um, traditions of folk justice and public shaming specifically, they were very often linked to marriage. Um, for various reasons I won't go into. Um, the most important element that links all of these traditions that are then often gathered together under the single name of Sharivari. The single element that's common to them is that the public display or the parade um, which you have, and very often the, the person concerned will be um, led through the town on, on an, an animal, very, very often facing backwards. And um, again, that's something that maybe resonates with the, the, the depiction of the, the people being led off to hell um, in the chapter from earlier. Um, this public display is highlighted by loud music or loud noise. Some scholars have called it paramusic. Um, because they see it as being a kind of an anti-music that's created, sometimes using musical instruments, which you can see here in this representation, um, but more often than not, and this is something you see here as well, by banging on pots and pans and those kind of things. The most important thing is to make a really, really loud, disturbing noise. Um, and so some of the related traditions that you have, um, the local traditions, have names that actually emphasise um, this. Um, the, this image that you see here, this is Hogarth's, uh, representation of a skimmington ride, um, but there, this is one of the English traditions. Um, but there's there are also other traditions in England that are known by the name rough music, for example. And again, this is actually capturing the most important element, um, or the more, most characteristic element of this um, of this particular punishment ritual. Um, the quite automatic term rantanning is another term that you hear used in, in Britain. Um, in Germany, there's uh, one of the associated traditions was called Katzenmusik or cat music. So again, you have this idea about it being a very, very unpleasant noise um, as being the key characteristic um, of these punishment um, rituals. And one theory that scholars have come up with is that this cacophony points to the, the, the disorder, the dissonance in the community, um, but also by doing this somehow nullifies this and seeks to um, reinstate the, the harmony of the community. Um, 
Now, these punishment rituals um, have a very long and a very important um, cultural history and cultural resonance. Um, to give you some kind of idea of this, um, which will also bring us closer to talking specifically about military justice systems, um, here are a couple of representations of Napoleon being sent into exile um, from the early 19th century. Exile is obviously the most extreme form that you can have of ostracising somebody from the community, um, shaming them um, and social violence. Um, but although it's much more serious than the Sharivari, the Sharivari sometimes has like slightly humorous connotations, um, but the way it's represented here resonates with the Sharivari tradition. So both of these traditions have um, Napoleon, whoops, I have to keep doing this, um, riding backwards on a donkey. Again, the fact that he's riding backwards is kind of reversing um, the tradition, the same thing as happens in, ca in Carnival. On this coin, you'll see him being led on a leash. I've heard that before, we'll hear about it again, and um, being led by the devil. Um, and in this particular version, um, he's not being held like on a leash, um, but there are musicians in the background who are playing on the drums, specifically military musicians. Now, what I find really interesting about these and this one in particular is that it points to connections that you could have, can trace in, in, in other ways as well between these Sharivari traditions as they were in civilian life and some of the traditions of military justice um, that actually in many cases um, had a longer life than the, the Sharivari traditions that they might in part have been based upon. You don't really know which way it goes if the Sharivari traditions draw from the military traditions or the other way out. Um, in particular, what's been shown here in, in this left-hand picture, you can see this has been a, a type of a sharivari, but it's also, through the presence of the drummers, um, a form of drumming out. Now, drumming out, to drum somebody out of the army, is a phrase that we still use up until this day. Um, and this was um, a tradition whereby a disgraced soldier, somebody who's been dismissed, um, would literally be drummed out, would be led to the, the gate of the barracks by people playing the drums, so that it was very, very clear that he wasn't simply leaving, he was leaving in disgrace. Um, drumming out is only one of the examples that links drums and drummers very, very closely um, with many traditions of um, military justice. Um, the practice of drumming out, incidentally, um, sometimes did also involve the soldier concerned or the former soldier concerned being led out of the barracks on a leash, again, which was held by the youngest drummer boy. Um, the drummer boys were supposed to always be about 14 and above, but in practice, some of them were as young as six. So this is another way of humiliating um, the person um, by getting them actually led to the edge of the barracks um, by this tiny little boy. Um, drummers also played a key role in the military punishment of flogging. Um, at least this was the case in the infantry, in the cavalry. Um, farriers were more likely to carry out this task. Um, this is something that I've explored, uh, researched specifically from the point of view of the British Army, but similar traditions were um, in place all over Europe <clears throat> up until um, some point in the 19th century. Um, it's not entirely clear why it was drummers or farriers that had to carry out the sentence of flogging. Um, it might simply have been because they had the necessary strength in their arms um, to carry out sentences of flogging, which um, certainly in Britain in the early 19th century could... Um, contain anything up to hundreds or even thousands of lashes. Sometimes it was so bad that um, the punishment had to be broken off so that the man didn't actually die from the number of times he was flogged. He would then be taken into the military hospital. They would wait till he got better, then they'd bring him back out and they'd start flogging him again until his hundred or thousand lashes were up. Um, so that might be one reason why the drummers were used. Um, it might also be simply because drummers and then in the cavalry, the farriers, whereby the position a little bit separate from the main body of soldiers. So it might have been easier um, to get them to carry out this, this punishment. Um, but as well as that, again, we have to also bear in mind the very, very ancient symbolic connections between drums and drumming and the idea of leadership and hence law and justice, um, things that are very important up to this day um, in military culture. Farriers, meanwhile, um, in many cultures have been associated with magic and the supernatural because of the, the magical things that they could do, you know, changing metal into new forms. Um, so that accordingly, they often also had a very high standing in many societies. So on the one hand, it might have been very practical reasons, or this might have been how it was portrayed. On the other, it might have been a practice that, that, that goes back to a much earlier um, symbolic association of the drum um, or with the, the practice of being a farrier or a blacksmith um, with, with power um, and therefore with leadership. Um, in the British Army, flogging was only completely outlawed in 
quite late in the in the 19th century, um, after a very very lengthy public campaign against it. And this image here is from a Chartist newspaper. The Chartists were a political reform movement who campaigned, amongst other things, for universal male suffrage. Obviously, only male suffrage because women are too emotional to vote. Here we go again. Um, but they supported many other causes as well. Um, the picture caption here for the life of a soldier plays on a very popular song of the day, a song that extolled the benefits of being in the army. Um, but the juxtaposition here um, is obviously demonstrating the one of the realities of army life, the extremely harsh system of discipline, um, a system of discipline that was so harsh that it was one of the reasons why the British army ended up with a serious recruitment problem, because nobody wanted to join the army unless they didn't have anywhere else to go. Um, and this was actually one of the arguments used against flogging, was that basically the system of punishment was such that people weren't joining the army and therefore the army was weak. Um, this picture isn't entirely realistic, however, because as far as I can tell, it wasn't common practice to have bands play, playing during flogging. They did play during other punishment rituals, such as executions, um, but I haven't found any evidence for them specifically playing during floggings. However, some members of the public did seem to think that this was the case, which is why you get these kind of representations. Um, and there was a very interesting discussion in the British Parliament in the early 19th century that demonstrates this. This discussion arose in 1824, when the Member of Parliament for Westminster, who was a Mr Hobhouse, um, put it to the chamber that when flogging took place at a barracks that was in his constituency, the Muse barracks, um, the drums were played in order to drown out the sound of the screams that were produced. Um, there was a very intense discussion in Parliament around this. People said this can't possibly be the case um, because flogging um, isn't carried out in that particular regiment. It's all, all but been abolished in this particular regiment. Um, and in any case, um, the drums would be played um, during a flogging anyway. Um, the point remained, however, that in the minds of members of the public, every time they heard the sound of drums, they thought of the corporal punishment. This was very, very fixed together. And some clarification emerged after a lot of discussions where it seemed to be that there had been an incident in the past um, where there had been a flogging which people living nearby had witnessed and the drums had indeed been played in that particular case for whatever reason. And thereafter, every time the drums sounded, those living nearby immediately had this association that there must be a flogging that was taking place. Now, there's a couple of interesting things um, that emerged from that. For one thing, this whole debate emerges because of the link that develops in people's minds between a certain musical activity which they hear and torture, in this case, flogging. Um, and interestingly, this is actually related quite directly to one of the ways that music and sound can be used in torture, because if a particular sound or a particular musical activity has always become linked in, linked in somebody's minds um, with the torture that they experience, then that sound itself can trigger all of the feelings of fear and anxiety um, which, as I've already mentioned, um, really increase the, the, the chance of long-term traumatisation for that person. Um, and there are instances where music and sound have been used during torture specifically with that end in mind, specifically to, um, to create that, that long-term traumatisation. Um, but the other thing that's important here is the reasoning that these eyewitnesses or earwitnesses give um, for the use of music or the drums in this um, occasion. Um, namely, they think that specifically it's being used to drown out the cries of those being flogged. Um, and this is interesting because it indicates something that's a little bit perverse about the logic. On the one hand, it's the sound of the drums that actually draws people's attention to what's going on in the barracks. Um, so it might drown out all their sounds, but nevertheless, it's also what's indicating that there's something unusual that's going on. Um, and what you also see here is that by this point, the, the, the kind of symbolic possible connotations um, seem to have become less important. And you're coming to a situation where the sound can only possibly be there, only possibly be used in that context in order to mask other aspects of what is going on. So it's no longer an integral part, a symbolic part of the punishment. It's, it's kind of, you know, there for a completely different function. Um, and this is important because this is something that we find time and time again when people up until today um, try and explain why sound, but particularly why music is used in the context of torture. They say it's basically there to drown out other noises, such as the noises of screaming. Um, there's another example of this um, that I want to point to. This comes from the quite recent testimony that was gathered um, on mass shootings of Jewish people in uh, remote rural areas of Ukraine and Poland in the early 1940s. Um, this is from the book 
the Holocaust uh, with bullets or by bullets by Patrick Dubois, um, who was a, a Catholic priest or is a Catholic priest that's been um, leading this project to uncover um, these um, these particular massacres. Um, and there's several cases mentioned in this um, book where locals um, who were there at the time, very often as very young children, um, where they report how people in the community were requisitioned to play a drum during the shootings. Um, and in another case, which is particularly interesting, um, a group of local people were made to bang on pots and pans during the shootings. And in this book, and it's not clear if this is Dubois' own interpretation or if this is the interpretation of the people in the community, this is again explained as being something that's there to drown out other sounds, in this case, the sound of the shooting. But again, you have to question what's really going on there. It was kind of obvious to everybody in the community that something really, really bad was happening with the, with the, you know, the Jewish members of the community, that they weren't just being transported off to Palestine, as they've been told. Um, you have to ask yourself, are these sounds really meant simply to create an illusion that all was well? Because at the same time, this very, very strange sound, particularly with the pots and pans being beat on, actually also draws attention to what is going on in that situation. It's something out of the ordinary is happening. And I think that that example with the pots and pans is particularly interesting because very obviously, if you know anything about the history of Sharivari practices, then you immediately think of those things. You immediately think of other types of very, very ritualized folkloric practices um, that are specifically um, designed to draw attention to the other in that situation who's been subjected to the punishment. Um, so it's difficult to tell without having further research to go on, but it, it does warn us against maybe being too quick simply to say that you know the music or the sound is only there kind of as an accessory after the fact to hide the evidence and not actually part of the punishment. Um, the use of sound in music has very often um, been justified by perpetrators in more recent years as being only there to cover up other sounds. Um, one of the arguments that's often used um, when it comes to techniques that are related to the techniques of sensory deprivation and overload that I've talked about, um, one of the justifications that often comes is that the, um, the music is being played in the prison simply to prevent the prisoners from communicating with one another, so to prevent eavesdropping basically, so that they can't get the stories right before they're questioned and things like that. Um, this justification has been used by the USA with regard to some of the facilities that they have where loud music is played constantly through the whole compound. Um, and it was also an argument that was used by the Israeli government vis-a-vis -vis the United Nations Committee Against Torture back in the late 1990s. Um, this came in response to representations that several human rights organisations had made um, regarding practices in some detention facilities which included um, exposing prisoners to very, very loud and, and a very, very strange music. Um, for a long time. So as I said, the, 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 the Israeli government, similar to what the, the US government has done more recently, basically said we were really just trying to make sure that when we brought people in for questioning, they couldn't communicate with each other. Um, the issue, however, was quite crucially, it wasn't just music that was used in these contexts. The music came in tandem with other practices that we now would recognise immediately as being the core elements of sensory deprivation techniques. And this is why I'm mentioning this specific example, because it's only one of many, but it's important, because this is, the, the as to my knowledge, the first time that the UN Committee Against Torture, and its concluding observations on this report um, from Israel, um, specifically mentioned the sound of loud music for prolonged periods, particularly where methods, these methods are used in combination um, actually came out and said this constitutes a form of torture. So we have it there in black and white that they have recognised that these practices are not simply inhuman and degrading as it was in the 1970s, um, but they do actually constitute a form of torture. That's pretty significant. Um, it was significant in the Israeli case because the Israeli Supreme Court then went on to prohibit these techniques. Um, but unfortunately, not all countries followed suit. And the irony of this is that the USA, who in their um, state reports that the CIA published, um, for many years had criticised the use of music in uh, ill treatment and torture in other countries, including Turkey and Cuba as well as Israel, so again this use of loud music. Um, the USA itself then went on to apply these techniques um, in a very, very um, well honed fashion, um, officially in the war on terror. And I say officially because these techniques were originally developed in the mid-20th century 
by the US government, by the Canadian government and by the British government in, in tandem. And it's probably the USA and the UK in particular that are responsible for these methods being used in so many countries around the world um, because they were um, involved in training the security personnel in those countries um, from the 1970s onwards, particularly in the context of the Cold War. So that's me coming to my conclusion now. I was right, I am almost actually over an hour a little bit. Um, we have covered an awful lot of ground <laughs> from the early days of Athenian democracy right up to the war on terror and beyond. Um, and what I'm trying to get at here is that I think there's a, a direct rhetorical link here between the ways in the, in the 20th and 21st centuries, Western countries on the one hand present themselves as being you know, the civilised world, that we have rule of law, um, we are the leaders of the world when it comes to human rights and the prohibition of torture, all of these kind of things. And one in the same time, we're very, very happy to renege on all of that when faced with those classed as terrorists, which is kind of like a, another version of the barbarian. If you call somebody a terrorist, um, it immediately puts them into a certain class of people that you can do many things with that you couldn't do with quote-unquote civilised people. Um, what I find is interesting is that in this discourse in, in the West, the way that the, the use of torture has been um, justified, um, you'll find people trying to make rational arguments. So they'll use kind of arithmetic arguments, um, for example, in the, the so-called ticking bomb scenario, which is basically where you say, well, we have to torture this one person because by harming this one person, then we see all these other hundreds of people who otherwise would be the victims of this bomb. So you see this idea of reason kind of trying to creep into this. Um, whereby the irony that's inherent in this situation is that because it's a rhetorical system, it's all predicated on emotion. It's got nothing at all to do with reason. It's to do with winning an argument on an emotional basis. And it's also not very sophisticated. Once you know what the basic tropes of this ideology are, um, it's very, very easy to dismantle them and to recognise them. The problem, of course, is that the power structures that have been bolstered by this ideology um, remain deeply entrenched in how we think and how we communicate. We've all participated in this, um, I would imagine. Um, and they have bolstered these power structures for you know, quite literally hundreds, if not thousands of years. Um, what I want to close with, though, is um, a couple of thoughts just related to this, um, how this relates to the attitude that we take to music in modern Western society. Because I think what's clear when we contrast um, the medieval and early modern examples um, with the more recent um, takes on this topic is that in the medieval early modern examples, um, it's the symbolic and ritual importance of music or paramusic, anti-music um, that obviously uh, comes to the fore. Um, on the one hand, the association of the other with noise and disturbance continues up to the present day. So the, the example that we saw from Constance, I think, is a really, really good example of that. Um, and I also think that it's significant that although there's been a very wide range of music that's been used in torture um, recently, so we know that Tchaikovsky has been used in some situations, we know that Johnny Cash has been used, all sorts of different types of music, the media representations of how music is used in torture almost invariably pick out the go-to genres for discussions of music and violence. So that's basically metal music and rap music, that's the two that they always come up with. And again, we can see this as being an attempt of civilised society, because of course civilised people don't listen to metal or rap, to distance themselves um, from um, the violence that's been perpetrated in their name and torture, um, but also again because it's seen as being these are particularly violent music, forms of music enjoyed by others within our own society, and therefore it's these forms that we want to focus on as being the forms that are used in torture, and not, for example, you know, Tchaikovsky or anything else. Um, this tendency as well that I talked about to reduce music to the noise it makes, so to basically say all that's happening in music torture is trying to, to drown out other noises, um, to downplay the, the, these symbolic aspects um, and these ritualised aspects of musical life, um, is quite symptomatic of how we deal with music in, in modern Western society. It's something that also makes the work of a musicologist very, very difficult when we try and actually go beyond simply talking about music to talking about the political ramifications of music, um, the, the political and social foundations um, of musical practice. Um, and that is why I'm so happy to be here tonight and to have this opportunity um, afforded me by Joel and James uh, to broadcast these thoughts to you tonight. Um, and as I mentioned at the start, I have really um, taken up an awful lot of your time. If you have any energy left, any time left, I'd be very, very happy um, for your own comments on what I've talked about 
but also if you've got any other questions um, on my work in music and torture, um, I'd be very, very happy to attempt to answer those as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.